right, thank you for joining me on this episode of the Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marlon Wilson, and we have another one back to back. If you joined me last last night, I had a debate with Dr. Dale Tuggy and Sean, Dr. Sean Cole, and they were talking about does the Bible teach uh, that God is a Trinity? So uh, hopefully you got to check that one out. But if you didn't, uh, you can always go to my YouTube page and uh, go ahead and subscribe and like while you're there. And you'll see that video there. So if you have time, go ahead and check it out. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And as I always say, uh, with the gospel truth, we are engaging the culture of Christian truth. And we do that with debate. We do that with interviews. And we do that with biblical lessons. Uh, we talk about a little bit of theology and things like that. So if you're interested, not only can you go to the YouTube page and subscribe and like and do all that good stuff, but go to the Facebook page as well. And like over there, like and follow there as well. And as always, once you go to those pages and like and subscribe, make sure you are cutting those notification bells on as well so you won't miss a live show or upload a video. Um, so, you know, it's always a joy. I'm all, I always enjoy having these discussions and these debates because not only does it bring glory to God, obviously, but it, I also enjoy just filling the body of Christ with knowledge, you know. Uh, training the body up to be able to prepare them for what's in this world, you know, and that that knowledge is, uh, you know, as a believer, as somebody in Christ, we shouldn't be hoarding knowledge, you know, we shouldn't be keeping knowledge for ourselves, we should always be ready to train up uh, the body, so that's the whole goal of this ministry is to enlighten the body of Christ to those contrary worldviews and their arguments so that the body will be prepared to defend the faith and also to sort of dive to some of the more intricate, more uh, more fine-tuned aspects of the faith, especially when it comes to apologetics, and that's what I have for you today. Um, I have a, an apologetic debate uh, between Cody LaVolt and Seth Bloomsburg, and they're going to be discussing, uh, if I can remember, it's a long title, so I might have to go back and look at it again, um, and I don't remember it, so you guys are going to have to check out the thumbnail and check out the title too. But anyway, it's, it's basically a classical, classicalist and presuppositionist apologetic debate here. Um, so, um, and I'm ready for this one because I'm ready. These guys are some some dogs, boy, when it comes to apologetics, man. They, they rip their opponents apart, man. They're vicious, if you will. You know, if a Christian can be vicious, these guys are vicious, you know. So, <laughs> so I'm really, really excited for this one because I know I will learn something from these two individuals as well. But before we get into that and I bring these guys in, let me go over a couple things that I have coming up. Let me bring this up real quick. All right, and I am behind the PowerPoint and I can't be that way. So let me prop up a little bit. All right, so coming up, man, I didn't really mess this one up. So coming up, uh, December 17th, I have Clay Hall versus J.P. Charles Boyce. I think I pronounced that right. And they'll be debating the interpretation of Romans 9. What should the interpretation of Romans 9 be? And that's always a good one. You know, when you get up a Calvinist and a non-Calvinist get together, man, you know, it's, it's going to be fireworks when it comes to that subject matter of Romans 9. Um, also, I have coming up, uh, is there biblical evidence for flat earth? You know, this is our first flat earth debate. Um, I don't know how this is going to go. Um, this is probably the first flat earth debate that I've actually watched or cared to watch. Um, so it'll be interesting. Um, but that's coming up, and that's going to be December 19th. Um, and that's going to be Vernon Baumann versus Jonathan Walters. And so we'll be on the lookout for that December 19th, 6, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, then we're going to have a Christmas showdown. Mr. Mike Jones, Mr. Inspiring Philosophy himself. We're going up against J. Scheider, who is very prominent in the community of uh, in urban apologetics. So this should be a fiery one. Um, and this Christmas showdown, like I said, and that'd be debating against Christmas, a pagan holiday. You know, I don't mean to ruin anybody's Christmas with this, uh, this debate. <laughs> So I hope after this debate, nobody goes and burns down their Christmas trees and, and rips down the uh, the Santa Claus that you may have in your front yard. I don't want none of that. Um, but this debate it should be a good one. Um, so, and next up, right back to flat earth. Oh, man, we got a, a double dose of it this month. Um, so this one, will be, this one will be more on the scientific side. Is there scientific evidence for a flat earth? Um, the last debate was biblical evidence. This was scientific evidence. So we get a double dose, and it will be Jonathan Walters again. He wanted to jump on again. And if I pronounce this right, I don't mean to destroy your name. Uh, uh, 
it, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name, Pinar, and there's going to be uh, a pretty good, a pretty, I, I'm sure this will be a pretty good debate. Uh, but with that said, I do want to bring in my guest, and, um, you know, I was connected with Cody LeBold, um through an individual who just came on my show and debated um, David Lewis and by the name of David Powman, and he connected me to uh, Cody LeBold, and uh, Cody LeBold, me and him chopped it up a little bit, and he decided to go for it, um, and Seth, no fear, uh, Seth, no fear Bloomsburg, let me tell you about Seth, I will post something on fa on my Gasp for Truth page, right? And within minutes, Seth is talking about me, me, or got his blow the emoji with the raising hand emoji, like me. I'm like, man, Seth be on it. He ain't got no fear. Any subject, he really to tackle. So that's my nickname for Seth. Seth, no fear of Bloomsburg. So uh, these guys came on. I got familiar with Seth through Facebook, through the presuppositional apologetic uh, forums and things like that. So he's been on my show before. He debated an atheist. So I'm familiar with Seth. So good stuff, good stuff. But let me bring these guys in so these guys can... Give an introduction themselves. What's up, fellas? How y'all doing? Hello. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Welcome back, Seth. And welcome for the first time, Mr. Cody LeBolt. I appreciate both of y'all for being here. Um, so with that said, I do want you to give, give you guys a chance to introduce yourself to the audience. Um, so Seth, I mean, not Seth, but uh, Cody, if you don't mind, could you go ahead and give a, a quick introduction to yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Cody Leibolt, and... I, my wife, Sasha, and I have two kids, and we live in Irvine, California. We're members at Sovereign Grace Church of Orange. And I studied at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. I worked as a music teacher, a music minister, and most recently as a copywriter and as a digital marketer. I have a website at christianintellectual.com, along with my friend Jacob Brunton. And uh, we are trying to restore the role of the mind in Orthodox Christian life through classical apologetics as well as a philosophy of reason and objectivity. All right. Thank you, Cody, for that introduction. Appreciate you. All right, Seth, give us a quick introduction to yourself. I'm a Christian. I graduated from New St. Andrews College, and I have a deep interest in all things apologetics. All right, Seth, you got to start giving me a little bit more, man. You got to give me a little, a little <laughs> bit more uh, uh, intro, brother. But uh, you good, man. I'm messing with you, man. Good stuff. Good stuff, fellas. Appreciate y'all. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get to this, this uh, format. So starting off, it'll be a 15-minute opening statement from both parties, and then we will go into a 60-minute cross-examination. Uh, each person will get three 10-minute opportunities to ask its op their opponent questions. Um, as that, I will let you know when that 10-minute expires. Um, after that 60-minute cross-examination portion of this debate, we'll transition to a 10-minute closing. And after that 10-minute closing, we will go into audience Q&A. Uh, so we're good with that, fellas? Sounds great. We're good. All right. So Cody, he volunteered to go first. So we are going to throw it at you, Cody. You got it, brother. All right. Hey, let me open this with a very quick word of prayer. Uh, and I'm going to read it. So my eyes are open. But Father in heaven, in our words today, may each of us represent you and scripture in a way that shows the truth. And please help Seth and I both to be edifying to our listeners. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Seth, thank you for being willing to talk with me about this. It's fun to be able to do this. This is my first time doing a debate. So I have to say, I'm expecting it to be wrong, but that's okay. We'll, we'll see how it goes. So here's my presentation. Uh, in case you missed the title, we are looking at the logically fundamental facts within man's structure of knowledge. After some discussion, Seth and I together figured, oh, that's where we disagree, or at least that's a key point. So here will be my opening remarks. What is the ready defense that we should give to the unbeliever? How should we tell him of the hope that is within us? That is the question of apologetics, and it matters because Christianity matters. We need to teach truly. You and I have seen kids grow up in church and fall away. We've seen true and compelling Christian teaching ridiculed by most cultural leaders today with no fear of hearing an answer that would actually make them feel ashamed. They're fearless. Together, we desire to build the church. And we want to do it by teaching. So what is it that we are teaching? Today we're going to discuss what counts as a God-honoring defense of the faith. And today I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. 1 Corinthians 10. I advocate the traditional Reformed approach to apologetics and epistemology. It's called classical apologetics. It was the view of R.C. Sproul, Charles Hodge, B.B. Warfield, and many others, including, I will point out, John Calvin. Presuppositionalism is the innovation. 
It was developed in the 20th century, and its leading proponent was Cornelius Van Til. It is Van Til's version that is most prevalent today and that we will be discussing. Apologetics, says Van Til, has always been unbiblical and therefore inadequate. So he comes to make an innovation compared to the people that had given apologetic arguments for hundreds of years before him. The traditional or the classical view and the presuppositional view have been hotly debated for 70 years now. Among reform thinkers today, the presuppositional view is common and the classical view is probably the underdog, but it still has many well-respected defenders. So you can see the website that Jacob Brunton and I have at christianintellectual.com. We take a strong position. You can look at Ligonier Ministries, R.C. Sproul's ministry. He is famous for that position. Let me share with you something from Keith Matheson. This is an article he wrote at Table Talk explaining Van Til's system. He writes, his goal was to develop an apologetic methodology that would be consistent with Reformed theology. He believed that all other apologetic methodologies lacked such consistency. Van Til held that the Trinitarian God is, quote, the only possible presupposition for the possibility of predication. Predication just means, in this case, making claims. He took issue with the traditional apologetic method because he said it assumes the autonomy of reason. It assumes that the sinner stands as the judge over the evidence for and against God and uses his reason to determine the truth. A student of Van Til, John Frame, explains the apologetic system. It makes two basic assertions. One, that human beings are obligated to presuppose God in all of their thinking. And two, that unbelievers resist this obligation in every aspect of thought and life. Van Til summarizes his view and his prescriptions, saying, first present the facts for what they really are, and then challenge the natural man by arguing that unless they are accepted for what they are according to the Christian interpretations of them. No facts mean anything at all. And, and so these facts, the, uh, the, the key facts of the Christian worldview are going to include God's existence, the fact that God created the world, that he created man in his image, uh, that man has fallen into sin, that God has a plan, that God has providence. These are the key aspects of the Christian worldview. So Greg Bonson, another student of Van Til, said, God makes a radical demand on the believer's life, which includes never demanding proof of God or trying him. You get that? Never demanding proof. So contrast this with the classical approach, which would present the unbeliever with evidence that there is a God and that Jesus rose from the dead, typically in that order. Our differences today are going to center on whether it is appropriate to start in apologetics by arguing from nature that God exists. From nature that God exists. That's our key divergent point. Now, I want to make clear that Van Til's view is something new and different. And I can show this by comparing Van Til to John Calvin. Here is John Calvin's view on the subject, which I actually endorse. And I'm relying on Keith Matheson for finding this. So Calvin writes that God was shown by natural arguments, evidences. That's in his commentary in Acts 14. It's the verse that says, Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven. And so Paul is talking about natural evidences. Commenting on Acts 17, Paul in Athens, Calvin says that Paul showed by natural arguments who and what God is. Calvin is claiming that the apostles used a natural theology in their apologetics, is what Matheson points out. And I agree with Matheson here. Calvin writes, Paul's drift is to teach what God is. Further, furthermore, because he hath to deal with profane men, he draweth proofs from nature itself, for in vain should he have cited testimonies of Scripture. It would be vain for Paul to cite testimonies of Scripture to men who did not accept the authority of Scripture, Matheson summarizes. And, and he goes on, Thus, Paul, according to Calvin, draws proof from a common ground from the created world on which we both stand. He uses natural theology. Friends, if you do not believe in common ground between the Christian and, un, and the unbeliever, look down. You're standing on the common ground. That ground, the earth, the created world, is the common ground sufficient that we can and should show men something of God's nature, reasoning from what is seen to what is unseen. Romans 1.20 speaks of God's invisible qualities, quote, being understood from what has been made. That's an important word there. In the logical and the chronological order of how we come to know, the physical world comes first. We reason from the seen 
to the unseen. That is my thesis stated in a preliminary way. Arguments that start from observation are good. They are Calvinist, and they are biblical. They are Christian. Arguments from observation come in two main forms. First, there is a natural theology, which is observations about the natural world leading to conclusions about God. And second, there are arguments from special historical events, signs and wonders, miracles that people have witnessed and testified about. The Bible would have us be witnesses of both of these types of observations. We are to report what we see, and we are to report what the first disciples of Jesus saw and what they conveyed down to us by reasonable means. Observation of God and his work is the grounding of our faith. To say otherwise would make faith different from what it always was for God's people, as described in the Bible. Remember, he is the God who revealed himself to the nation of Israel by a cloud and by a pillar of fire, and by pushing the Red Sea aside. Remember, this is Jesus who revealed himself to Paul with a light from heaven as he was on the road to Damascus. He spoke to Paul and Paul believed. Are we different from Paul? That we would need to believe from a new transcendental kind of argument about the supposed need to presuppose. Created in the vein of Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment skeptics and philosophical idealists. For example, Kant and Hegel. Take the Bible as it is. Speak biblically about these things. When Jesus appeared to Paul, he told him, Now, get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. Acts 26. 1 John 1-2 similarly highlights that God has shown himself and has been seen. The life appeared, we have seen it, and testify to it. We should follow the example of the disciples, counting ourselves as witnesses, as messengers. And in our case, due to the remoteness of history, we convey that message about what others have seen and what they've credibly reported. So we're witnesses, we're messengers. And when we tell the unbeliever about his condemnation before God, we seek to persuade him. We persuade men, is what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.11. To do this, we should appeal to facts the unbeliever already has the ability to judge for himself. Van Til would have us appeal to some kind of innate knowledge of God that he imagines that we all have. I don't think we do. Either way, though, the question that we should be asking is, do the scriptures show anyone arguing that way about innate knowledge? We should make our case credible to the judgment of our listeners. That's the model that I see in Scripture. People prove the case, and that is the classical traditional perspective. The presuppositionalists cannot agree with that. As I pointed out earlier, Greg Bonson's view was that God makes a radical claim on the believer's life which involves never demanding proof of God or trying him. It is whiplash to get from the Bible to Bonson. Whiplash. If you compare the way the Bible treats evidence and proof versus... Van Til and Bonson. You can immediately see how incompatible they are. Hardly a day can go by in your Bible reading that you will not notice this now that you're looking for it. Now, to be clear, the classical view does agree with Bonson and Van Til that the hardness of a man's heart prevents him from putting his faith in Christ apart from the Holy Spirit, giving that man the gift of faith, Ephesians 2. But at the same time, we should proclaim a message that is credible, shouldn't we? As good teachers, we should account for what the listener might consider credible, just as Paul did, as John Calvin observes him doing. We should appeal to facts the listener already understands and facts he knows he understands in the normal sense. We should build fact upon fact to show that unless the listener would be dishonest, he must conclude that Jesus is Lord. Report the facts of the case as you have observed it. Be willing and be able to show how you know that it all actually happened. Be like Peter. He stands up and says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know, Acts 2. Be like Paul, appeal to the facts your listener knows. He says to Agrippa and Festus, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner, Acts 26. Paul is talking about what Agrippa has seen and had heard about. To the Greeks in Athens, Paul argued differently, because they had a different context of knowledge. In Acts 17, Paul says to the Athenian idol worshippers, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. 
and he is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else, Acts 17. Paul is appealing to what his listener should consider obvious. He holds his listener to account for what he already knows, and what he would even say is common knowledge. Paul aims to show the Athenians how even in the light of general revelation they are guilty. In particular, he calls them ignorant for worshiping idols. They could have, they should have, known it was wrong in light of general revelation. As the Westminster Confession of Faith describes, the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and the power of God as to leave men unexcusable. They were echoing Paul when they wrote that. So then Paul indicts the Athenians. He acts as a witness to them, and he tells them what God commands them to do, and he does not do it in an arbitrary way. He tells them that God will judge the world by the man that he has appointed, and that God has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul himself can be a witness that this is the case. He's seen Jesus. Paul has been given the ability to perform miracles too, by the way, and these attest that he is God's messenger. And Paul is not the only witness. Jesus appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, says 1 Corinthians 15. That was considered to be an account worth noting. If Bonson is correct, I want to ask you why. Why would it have been an account worth noting? The biblical authors considered evidence to be the ground of belief. Are you feeling that whiplash from Van Til and Bonson to the Bible? The apostles do not say you should believe because God says so and he is right. They make claims that people can test by their own thought and inquiry. Had they done otherwise, they would have been making a dogmatic appeal to authority. The Bible takes for granted that people have common sense knowledge of the world around them and that by these things they can and should know about God and morality. And they do learn much about God and morality, it says in Romans 2.15. Or notice in another place Paul says, does not nature itself teach you? Or the psalmist says, the heavens declare. Or in Romans 1.20, as we mentioned, God's eternal power and divine nature are being understood from what has been made. The way to learn things about God is from observation. As far as any of the Bible's examples would indicate, there is not any other way. Innate knowledge is not an idea taught in Scripture or relied on in any of the examples that we can find in Scripture. The apostles considered the truth of the Christian worldview to be something to persuade others about. We persuade men, Paul says. So, to narrow in on the technical statement of my thesis, in our knowledge, we have no choice about where to start. We start with, there's something there in front of me. We start with observation. That is our most basic kind of knowledge. All knowledge is built from observation and from reasoning about observation. There's nothing in the mind that was not first in the senses. The most logically fundamental facts in man's knowledge are what the classical synthesis, going back to Aquinas and earlier, would say that they are. The most logically fundamental facts are the common sense axiomatic concepts. Something exists. I'm aware of it. It is something. These are logically basic. When I say they're logically basic, I mean... Anytime you make a kind of claim at all, you're also claiming something exists, I'm aware of it, it's something. These are logically conveyed anytime you convey any claim. So my full thesis in a sentence is, the logically fundamental facts in man's knowledge are the common sense axioms, things like existence, consciousness, and identity. If you know anything, you know these things. To know that God exists may be a relatively simple inference. I believe it is. It's the kind that everyone can make, whether they're unlearned, whatever. But it is an inference. And it is not the kind of thing that people know innately. As Paul says, they understand it from what has been made in Romans 1. The things that have been made are understood first. No one starts with a worldview. A worldview is a complex set of ideas. To demand that someone starts with a worldview is to demand the impossible. To demand other people's assent to an idea because it is true rather than because you can see it is true by the following way would be an assault on man's rationality. It would be to teach fideism, blind faith, in practice, if not in name. And for these reasons, Van Til's apologetic should be rejected. Let us return to the model seen in scripture itself. We persuade men. All right. Thank you for that open statement, Cody. Appreciate you. All right, Seth, you got it for 15 minutes. All right. Am I, is uh, my mic still good? Yeah, you're good. Try to get a little bit closer because it does sound like your volume is a little bit low, but uh, your mic sounds great outside of that. Is that better? Yes, yeah, a little bit. That's better. Okay. 
Our debate today touches on one of the most fundamental questions man has ever asked himself. How does he know what he knows? In this context, Cody and I are both Christians, so we both take the Bible to, the, to be the infallible Word of God. Where we differ is how exactly the Word of God works within our worldviews. From my view, the strict answer to the thesis question of what are the logically fundamental facts in man's structure of knowledge is simply this, the presuppositions of the Christian worldview. But I want to make sure my opponent and my audience understand what I mean by this before I go any further. A worldview is a network of presuppositions which are not tested by natural science and in terms of which all experience is related and interpreted. Worldviews have three main areas of concern, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Metaphysics is the study of the ultimate nature of reality, the origin, structure, and nature of what is real. Epistemology is the study of knowledge and knowing, the nature and limits of knowledge, belief, and truth, and how they are justified. Ethics is the study of right and wrong, good and bad, moral responsibility, and obligation. In other words, your worldview is your overall belief system, and your belief system consists of your beliefs about what exists, how we know what we know, and how we should live our lives. Now, I'm what's called a presuppositionalist, which is a name for the school of apologetics I adhere to. Apologetics is the study of the defense of the faith, which obviously is very closely tied to the study of how we know what we know, and is thus very relevant to the question of what is necessary for man's structure of knowledge. Cody is what's called a classicalist. I'll let him define what he means by that. As for me, I believe all men have a worldview, whether they say they do or not. All men live in terms of either a Christian worldview, where the existence of God is recognized and the truth of Scripture revered, or man lives in terms of some worldview where God is not rec recognized, whether atheism, agnosticism, Hinduism, materialism, or something else. My position can be easily summarized by C.S. Lewis's tree branch analogy uh, in Mere Christianity. He once said that arguing against God is much like cutting off the tree branch you are sitting on. You must presuppose God's existence in order to argue against him. The only way arguments even make sense is if you presuppose God's existence, wherein a rational God controls the universe and has given man the gift of rationality. God's existence and the truth of the Bible is thus, is thus established in an indirect way. Greg Bonson once summarized this by saying that the only proof for the existence of God is that without God, you can't prove anything. God's existence is this fundamental to the knowledge of any fact whatsoever that man must presuppose God's existence in order to know anything. I should interject here to say that uh, to say that it's quite obvious to both sides that if God doesn't exist, then we can't prove anything because we wouldn't exist. That is obviously not what I mean. What I mean is that in order for man to know anything or justify his knowledge of anything, he must openly profess and believe in the God of Scripture. God exists whether someone believes in him or not, but in order for someone to justify their knowledge claims about anything, they must believe in him. Before I go any further, I'd like to illustrate this so the audience at least knows a little bit about what I mean. The best, I can, the best example I can give of this would be something like Hinduism. In the Upanishads, it is explicitly taught that all reality is illusory. There is no logical distinction between right and wrong, true and false, and existent versus non-existent. This creates a problem, though. This undercuts the Hindu's ability to even argue for his own position. By even asserting that Hinduism is true, he is fundamentally denying one of its own fundamental principles. His position is self-destructive. He has denied the God of the Bible, and every fact he believes to be true is actually, in terms of his own worldview, completely meaningless, because according to him, there is no difference between true and false. Knowledge is justified true belief. The Hindu's assertions may be true, and he may believe them, but he has completely undercut his ability to justify his beliefs whatsoever. I'll give one more illustration from Lewis since it's so spot on. His critique of a completely naturalistic worldview goes like this. One absolute central inconsistency ruins the naturalistic worldview. The whole picture professes to, be, to depend on inferences from observed facts. Unless inference is valid, the whole picture disappears. Unless reason is an absolute, all is in ruins. Yet those who ask me to believe this world picture also ask me to believe that reason is simply the unforeseen and unintended byproduct of mindless matter at one stage of its endless and aimless becoming. Here is flat contradiction. They ask me at the same moment to accept a conclusion and to discredit the only testimony on which that conclusion can be based. And that's the end quote. Now, someone may be wondering at this point, but of course non-Christians do know things. Of course they do, but I need to make a few distinctions about this. First of all, we must distinguish between the psychology of the unbeliever and his epistemology. Although all unbelieving worldview, worldviews are ultimately self-destructive of knowledge, as, one, as Roman, Romans 1 asserts that those who don't believe in God become vain in their reasonings, 
Unbelievers often act psychologically as, as if things were true. They often condemn murder, theft, or rape, or believe in logical absolutes or the causality of nature. But given their non-Christian presuppositions, they epistemologically have no basis for these beliefs. The unbeliever is then caught in a sort of tension. He believes and acts like facts exist and knowledge is justifiable, all the while being unable to give a coherent account as to why he knows these facts. Second, one of the things the Bible teaches about man is that he is fundamentally self-deceived. But what is self-deception? I think I can easily illustrate what this looks like. I think we've all had to deal with someone whose coffee is always wrong, for example. Every morning they come in, the barista makes their coffee, but there was always something wrong with it. Too hot, too cold, not enough flavor, too foamy, etc. I'm sure it was all, we've all dealt with this kind of person. This is the kind of person who is self-deceived. They know, deep down, their coffee is actually correct. But they have a vested interest in there being something wrong with it, so they can have a justification for having a complaint. They are the kind of person who doesn't actually want their coffee correct. They want to complain. But the person will, of course, complain the whole time that they just want their coffee right. But the situation here isn't a mere contradiction. This kind of person is not asserting P, my coffee is correct, and not P, it is false that my coffee is correct. In his PhD dissertation, dissertation Greg Monson says the kind of situation described here exhibits what is co often called an iterated belief, or a belief about a belief. Deep down, this person knows their coffee is correct, but they also believe that they don't believe that their coffee is correct. This person has deceived themselves into thinking that they don't believe their coffee is correct. The situation of the unbeliever is similar. According to Romans 1, the unbeliever knows God. Every person in existence, every atheist, Muslim, Jew, or Hindu, believes in the Trinitarian God of Scripture, but they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. They have deceived themselves by means of their own sin. They have tricked themselves into believing that they don't believe in God, and the only thing that can remove this kind of self-deception is the grace of God. Just like the woman with the copy, unbelievers truly know what they are doing, but they have, not, but they have deceived themselves into believing that they don't. If you talk to them, they will obviously not admit that God exists, but they will show signs that they know that he does. Again, they act psychologically like certain things are true, such as murder, murder is wrong, while not being able to account for this belief. They thus borrow from the Christian worldview in order to maintain their beliefs, all the while denying the only possible foundation for those beliefs. I should specify at this point that I mean specifically the Trinitarian Christian God. I've read and studied the sacred texts of various religions, such as Mormonism, Hinduism, and Islam. Because of the worldview revealed in those texts, I don't believe any god, but the Trinitarian Christian God provides the preconditions of intelligibility. A few last points. Just because presuppositionalists teach that the word of God is the only foundation for knowledge, this does not imply that we reject evidences. In fact, we believe that all of God's creation reveals his, divines, his divine power, as Romans 1 teaches. So all facts in existence rightly interpreted, prove God's existence. To illustrate this, imagine yourself on a diving board overlooking a pool. Is it, true to, is it true to say you are being held up by the board? Of course. Is it also true to say you are being upheld by the concrete that holds the diving board up? This is also true. But the concrete is the foundation that allows the diving board to hold you up. This illustrates well the difference between approximate source of knowledge versus one's ultimate source of knowledge. We teach that man's only true ultimate source for knowledge is the word of God, and all other ground is sinking sand. But that doesn't mean I distrust my senses or my reason. But when I appeal to reason, I am appealing to reason as interpreted by scripture. Scripture does teach that man can and ought to reason, but you can't look at me citing evidence and say, look, you're making your reason the final authority, final standard and authority. No, that would be like saying, because you're standing on a diving board, the concrete doesn't exist. That wouldn't make any sense. I can appeal to my own knowledge and evidences as proof of God without making those my ultimate authority. God's word remains the ultimate authority here. Starting with God as the ultimate interpreter of any fact doesn't mean we have to start every sentence by mentioning him, but it does mean we have to recognize that without presupposing him, our proximate source of knowledge doesn't prove anything. The last thing I need to address is the issue of circularity. There is a kind of circularity there is a sense in which presuppositionalists advocate circular reasoning, but it's a circular reasoning of a certain kind. We don't argue the Bible is true, therefore the Bible is true. This is a vicious circularity that is logically incorrect. But as John Frame points out, anyone with any belief system at all 
has a final authority for their beliefs or a foundation for their beliefs. When asked to explain how they know that their final authority is correct, they are stuck. If they argue by using their final authority, they are reasoning circularly. If they don't, then they are denying that their final authority in reasoning is really their final authority in reasoning. <coughs> Does that, um, and here's a quote from John Frame, Does that procedure deserve to be condemned as circular? Everyone else reasons the same way. Every philosophy must use its own standards in proving its conclusions. Otherwise, it is simply inconsistent. Those who believe that human reason is the ultimate authority, rationalists, must presuppose the authority of their reason in their arguments for rationalism. Those who believe in the ultimacy of sense experience must presuppose it in arguing for their philosophy, empiricism. And skeptics must be skeptical of their own skepticism, a fact that is, of course, the Achilles heel of skepticism. The point is that when one is arguing for an ultimate criterion, whether scripture, the Quran, human reason, sensation, sensation, or whatever, one must use criteria compatible with that conclusion. If that is circularity, then everybody is guilty of circularity. And that's the end quote. Whatever someone's final authority is, this doesn't mean we presuppose that every single conclusion that uses that authority is correct. People make mistakes. But what, it, what that person is doing is making some principle their final authority in determining what is true and false. Reasoning circularly about a particular fact is not the same thing as reasoning, circularity, reasoning circularly about a principle that applies to all facts. One further distinction. A presupposition should not be confused with a hypothesis. Recall that a presupposition was a principle not tested by natural science. So a presupposition is a principle that cannot be shown to be true or false by scientific experiment. For example, the causal principle would be regarded as a presupposition, but Newton's law is a hypothesis. Newton's law could theoretically be confirmed or disconfirmed by experiment, but the principle of causality itself couldn't be. Causality is a transcendental condition. If natural causes exist, it makes sense to attempt to confirm or disconfirm a scientific hypothesis. If natural causation does not exist, then attempting scientific experience would not prove anything about reality at all. Also, keep in mind in this debate that the word inconsistent can be used in four different ways. Logical inconsistency, moral inconsistency, transcendental inconsistency, or self-deception. A logical inconsistency is the case where somebody, when someone simply happens to believe or assert a proposition P and also a proposition not P. They may not openly do so, they may not be aware that they have that belief, or they may not be consciously thinking of either of them at the same time. But if they do believe, though, but, but if they do believe both, that is a logical inconsistency. Presuppositionalists should not be construed as saying that a mere logical inconsistency destroys someone's worldview. People who have the correct worldview could happen to have two, incorrect, two incompatible beliefs. Secondly, a moral in inconsistency does not invalidate someone's worldview either. If someone says they believe stealing is wrong, but they are caught shoplifting, this is morally inconsistent, but it does not demonstrate that the person's worldview cannot make sense of reality. Third, there is the inconsistency of self-deception explained above, wherein somebody has a belief P and simultaneously has a belief that they don't believe P. The main kind of inconsistency we are concerned with in this debate is a transcendental inconsistency. When an unbeliever asserts that genocide is wrong and simultaneously affirms that man is only an evolved animal, he is being transcendentally inconsistent. He asserts something that happens to be true when interpreted within the Christian worldview, the claim that genocide is wrong but attempts to place that within a worldview, naturalism, where such an assertion does not make sense and cannot be justified. Finally, I would submit that presuppositionalism is true because it is based on scripture. A quick rundown of verses in scripture teaches that every fact in existence is clear proof of God's existence, Romans 1-2, and thus all creatures, believers and unbelievers alike, know God. That all knowledge is, dependent, is deposited in Christ, and by implication one must be saved to have any true knowledge whatsoever, Colossians 2-3, Unbelievers in in one sense, uh, in another sense, also do not know God, John seventeen twenty five, and further that unbelievers do in yet another sense know certain things, such as how to predict the weather, Matthew sixteen three. However, someone however someone reconciles these biblical passages, they must recognize that the Bible, at different times in different senses, refers to the unbeliever as believing in God, not believing in God, having no knowledge whatsoever, and having knowledge. And I believe it is presuppositionalism only that is biblically consistent. All right. Thank you both for those opening statements. All right. So now we're moving into our cross-examination portion. 60 minutes, fellas. And each party will get three 10-minute opportunities to ask questions. Um, I will be keeping time in the background, and I will pop in when your time expires. 
So with that said, Cody, you are first up for your first 10 minute cross examination of Seth Bloomberg. Seth, thank you for your presentation. And it really helped that you were able to put it together uh, to, for me ahead of time. So I was able to actually study it. I appreciate that. One of the things that you recently mm -hmm. said was that presuppositional, it's it, it supported in scripture. And uh, yeah. the support that you gave was that every fact points to God, the heavens declare the glory of God, those kinds of things. So you and I may differ in how we understand that because the, uh, in my understanding is that these facts all point to God. That doesn't mean that every person has the knowledge innately. It means that they have it as as it, they've learned it from something else. Are we on the same page there? Do we agree? Um, my viewpoint is that every every fact in existence is proof of God's existence. But you have to ask, in what worldview is that fact being interpreted? If it's interpreted in an unbelieving worldview, it's not a fact at all. If uh, it's interpreted in the Christian worldview, then it is proof uh, of God's existence. You were talking earlier about knowledge being in one sense, but not in another. And I agree with your assessment there that the Bible is talking about different kinds of knowledge. So, for example, I would disagree with the way Bonson treats Proverbs 1-7. You know, he talks about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I, I, I evaluate that passage as not being a, talking about epistemology, but rather talking about moral wisdom. What's your thought on Proverbs 1-7? Um, I would agree with uh, Bonson's interpretation. I think it's basically saying what presuppositionalists usually say, that you can't have knowledge unless you start with God. Okay, do you uh, believe that based on reading the the verse before it and the verse after it? Uh, I believe it because I think that's what it says. I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, so that, that is your exegetical argument. It's it's not merely that one verse that you're looking at, but you, you're looking at the passage in context, and you're coming to the conclusion that it is talking in an epistemological context? Uh, keeping in mind, well, I don't think you can separate truth from morality. So I, I think I don't think you'd be wrong to say that it's talking about moral knowledge of God, but I think it talks I, I think what it's referring to is is all knowledge. For example, in Colossians 2, 3, where it talks about how all knowledge uh, and wisdom is deposited in Christ, it doesn't say all moral knowledge or all religious knowledge or all, you know, it doesn't it doesn't specify. It just says all knowledge. So I think all knowledge uh, cannot be properly interpreted unless you believe in God. You were distinguishing between the psychology versus the epistemology of the unbeliever. So there is an unbeliever who believes that murder is wrong. Yes. He cannot account for that belief the way that you say that he should be able to account for it. Uh, so is, is it your position that he, although he, he, he claims murder is wrong, he doesn't actually know murder is wrong? He, he cannot know that murder is wrong in terms of his worldview. He doesn't have knowledge is justified true belief. It's true that it's wrong. He may believe that it's wrong, but in terms of his worldview, he cannot justify the claim that it's wrong. So you're operating on the definition of knowledge as justified true belief, and your your point here is that he has not justified it. Uh, not not only that he does not, he can't, and it's impossible for him to in terms of his worldview. Okay, that is helpful to understand. So uh, it. The way, the way you and I would probably differ on this topic is I believe that somebody can have a justified belief without also knowing the proper way to account for that belief. I know that that sounds strange, but uh, there's I think there, there's different layers of being able to account for a belief. And so, for example, my five-year-old son will believe something because daddy said it's true. And he doesn't know all the ways that I can account for the belief, but he knows just enough that he can know that it is true and that he's justified in believing it because I am a credible authority. He evaluates that correctly. So mm -hmm. the, the way that I think about that is my son doesn't have epistemological knowledge at this point. He has given no consideration to his method of knowledge, and yet he still has mm – -hmm the knowledge. So I'm, I'm wondering why is that any different from the murderer who, although he cannot account for how he gained the knowledge, he still does have the knowledge. Uh, what I would say is, again, for any of these questions, you always have to ask in terms of which worldview are the terms being defined in terms, you know, is it, are we, 
you know, like with, with the Hindu, are we talking about proof, fact, reasoning, and existence in terms of his, world, his worldview, or are we talking about proof, fact, reasoning, and existence in terms of the unbeliever's worldview? I don't think this situation is quite the same. Um, you know, a, a five-year-old who doesn't know what a modus ponens is, you know, that doesn't mean that he can't know something. Um, I don't think he can give a philosophically per precise account for it. I think he can give a, a kind of justification for it. Um, you know, uh, children can, you, even a two-year-old can profess faith in Jesus and say, well, how do you know the Bible's true? Well, it's God's word. That's not sophisticated. It's not detailed. You wouldn't want to publish it in a theology book. <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that he cannot in any sense account for it. Obviously, as children go, grow older and they understand God's word better, they can give a better and better accounting. But I wouldn't say that he, that your son is not giving an account at all. I am saying that in terms of the, un, for the unbeliever, in terms of his worldview, he can't give any kind of account at all. It sounds to me like... So there's a difference between not being able to give a justification and maturing in your understanding of what your justification is. It sounds to me like then uh, somebody smells a daffodil and they say and they look at it and they see it's a daffodil. They know it's a daffodil. They say it's a daffodil, but be, but your your criticism of them is that they fail to understand that that is God's daffodil and that therefore their knowledge is incomplete. Is, is that accurate? I wouldn't say it's incomplete. I would say it is knowledge. I mean, if if you're talking to just the average person on the street and you ask them, what are your metaphysical presuppositions? Ninety nine percent of the people wouldn't even know what you're saying. But just because people don't know the terminology of philosophy and haven't learned logic and philosophy and that kind of thing, that doesn't mean that these facts don't adhere to them. Um, so if I, if I talk to somebody and I said, did you know you have a functioning heart and a kidney? Let's say they'd never taken an, a, a class on anatomy and they had no idea what a heart and a kidney were. And they were like, I don't know what those words mean. I don't have one. I don't need one. Um, you know, bye. Well, the fact is, he must have a functioning heart and a functioning kidney in order for him to exist and stand there and talk to me. Everyone must have some kind of worldview that is functioning within them, um, whether they know the terminology, terminology or not, or whether they know it or not, in order for them to have any kind of claim towards, you know, knowing that the daffodil smells good or something. You'd have to be a Christian in order to actually make a predication like that. Because, for example, with the Hindu, his his worldview is self-defeating. If a Hindu told me, um, well, that, you know, this is, this is a daffodil, I would say, no, in your worldview, being a daffodil and not being a daffodil are the same thing. There are no logical distinctions in your worldview. So you can't justify that claim. So the ability to justify it within the Christian worldview, that is the standard for whether it's actually knowledge. All right, so let's talk about innate knowledge. I think that that is another issue where you and I disagree. And I, I strongly say there is no innate knowledge at all. And I believe that okay. your position is that there is innate knowledge? Yes, I believe that's what Romans one twenty is saying. It says that, um, that uh, God's divine power and existence are clear to all men. So when it says that so they all, are all, seen from, uh, can you explain that part? I'm sorry, explain which part? Uh, they're understood from the things that have been made. So uh, do you see this as a process of inference or as immediate knowledge? Oh, um, no. I would say, so there's a difference between not all knowledge is discursive. So if I have, uh, you know, for somebody who's just starting on logic, you know, the, the famous syllogism, um, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's a discursive process of knowledge. But, re but I would say that recognizing, for example, recognizing somebody on the street, you don't, when you walk, or, you know, when we walk into your house and see your wife, you don't go through this, you know, syllogism or scientific experiment or some kind of inductive reasoning to think, now, is that really my wife? No, you just recognize her immediately. I think that's the kind of thing that the Bible is talking about when it says that unbelievers know God through the things that have been made. They recognize God's existence immediately, but because of their sin, because of their total depravity, they constantly and continually suppress that knowledge until God's grace um, saves them from that self-deception. So when you say recognize, do you mean that they already knew it and then they saw something that resembled it, like Plato would describe? Can you be more specific? I'm not sure I understand the question. 
So yeah, Plato's theory of knowledge was that everybody already knew everything and they just forgotten it in their earthly body. And that therefore the process of learning things was actually just the process of remembering things you already knew step by step. And the outside world would remind you of those things. So Plato's an idealist. And actually, uh, it's no coincidence that, that Immanuel Kant and Hegel and also uh, the whole stream leading up to Van Til, they, they, they were in a school of philosophical idealism. That was, that was the school in which Van Til was raised, and that's the language he speaks. And so uh, these, this idea that, uh, that you have an innate knowledge, but then the, the world observations trigger that knowledge so that you, as you said, recognize something that you knew before, uh, that sounds that sounds to me like Plato. I'm just asking if, if that's different or if it's the same. No, that um, I don't think Plato's theory of knowledge is. I don't think it works at all. Um, and I I would try to distinguish between uh, my view and, and his view. Um, it's not that we knew it before in some kind of past life or you know something like that. I think it's something. They when when unbelievers go about their day and just live their lives, they recognize and know God in everything, every fact, every law, every everything, everything. They recognize God. I mean, I'm not sure I can give you some kind of in-depth explanation of the unbelievers' psychology, but I think what the Bible teaches is that they recognize God everywhere they go in everything that exists and All surpass right. that knowledge. That's ten minutes right there. All right, Seth, you have 10 minutes to cross-examine Cody. Okay. Uh, Cody, you said... <coughs> uh, you said that what we do is we argue... You basically argue from our personal experience. We argue from the seen to the unseen. Is that correct? Yes, that's how I believe knowledge works. Okay. Um, how do you know that? Do you want me to give you a reason for how I know it? Yes. I mean, you, if you want to say that um, we just start with personal experience and we can really only build other knowledge upon personal experience, I would simply ask, how do you know that? I see. So what would you take as a, a satisfying answer? W what could I appeal to that would answer that? Well, I'm asking you to explain it in terms of your methodology and your world. Okay, so if it is correct that knowledge comes to us through observation and then reasoning about observations, then the way that I would have mm -hmm. any knowledge, including meta-knowledge, reflecting on what knowledge is, would also be through that same process. So I know that I know things by observation, by introspection, as I observe myself observing. Okay, so you know things... Well, you talked about building a fact upon fact, and then you kind of build, it's kind of a cumulative case for God's ex existence. What I'm asking is, if, if you say that our ultimate foundation for knowledge is observation, well, if you appeal to anything besides observation, then aren't you reasoning, or uh, then you're not really being consistent with your own standard, but then if you appeal to something that you do observe, aren't you reasoning circularly? Yeah, I see, I see where you're going there. So there is going to be a foundation. I'm a strong foundationalist when it comes to knowledge. And so if there is a foundation to what we know, then everything else that we know that's not that foundation, we demonstrate it by reference to that foundation. Now, okay. how do you go about determining what that foundation is and defending the proposition that that is the foundation? In order to do that, you cannot use proof. It's been pointed out that what are you going to do, use a deductive syllogism to prove that logic is valid? Wouldn't that be uh, a circular argument? Because how do you know that you're allowed to use deductive syllogisms? But that's why I say we do not use deductive syllogism to prove that logic is valid or that observation is the means of gaining knowledge. We don't, we don't mm -hmm. prove it in the technical sense of that word proof. We validate it by reference to the only means that we have available to us, which is that observation. In other words, if you okay, ask me, I, I don't, I don't think that I learn things by seeing. I would tell you, mm -hmm. I can't really help you except for just to tell you to look over there, and I would point. 
I'd say just look, and then and then if if you see it, you see it. If you don't see it, you don't see it. Uh, it in that sense. Uh, it is the traditional position is that the senses are incorrigible. They they are not to be doubted because they are the basis by which all of our ideas come, as as we know, as as we know by looking at each one of them. Okay, so the senses aren't to be doubted. Um, why not? How do you, so how, you're how asking you why should, why should we not doubt the, the senses? I would want to ask you, you a similar question, which is, okay. do you have a reason to doubt the senses? No, I don't, because I think that mm -hmm. what the Bible says about man is that when once he's is that um, man man's uh, once man's mind has been redeemed, then he he can actually uh, find true knowledge. So you're wanting me to offer a reason why I don't doubt the senses. Well, I am also a Christian. Okay. Right, but you said that the ultimate foundation was your sense observation. And you also, you also appeal to yeah, the laws I see, of logic. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Are universal statements. How would you prove a universal statement by individual, particular, empirical experience? Do you want me to answer you. that question or the previous one? Either one. <laughs> okay. So, can you restate the, the previous one? Because that other one just set my mind flying. Okay, sorry. Um, Going, going back to what you said about you can't, um, the senses are incorrigible, I think I can provide a foundation or a basis for saying that, man, that my empirical observation uh, can find truth. I would say that it's based in Scripture. When Scripture talks about man's empirical observations, it says that man can find knowledge using them. But you would say that that's reasoning circularly. So I, what I'm asking is, what's your solution? If your foundation for your knowledge is sense experience and you appeal to sense experience, you're reasoning circularly, which, he says, which you say you should never do. I would submit that you do, and everyone does, uh, like John Frame says. But if you appeal to anything else besides empirical observation, then you're just being inconsistent. So your choice is either reasoning circularly or being inconsistent with your own standard. So how do you, how would you actually demonstrate that empirical observation is true? On what basis? It is the kind of thing that is an axiom. So I, I don't acknowledge that it is circular to say I. I believe my observations because I have observed them. I don't think that's circular. Uh, okay. with, I, I think that that is foundational and axiomatic. Now, now, if if someone wants to deny that, you can show the the absurdity of denying it. But but you actually cannot show that it is valid because it is it is the foundation. I'm sorry, you can't show that it's valid. You cannot prove it. That's what I meant to say. Why can't I just say to people, well, that's my axiom, and you can't prove it wrong? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can demonstrate to you that you're treating it as an axiom as well, because in any statement that you make, you are also relying on it as being true. So you're treating it as a foundational undeniable as well. Um, the, the, but my, my question to you would be, why, why do you prefer to treat something else other than these things that are necessary for knowledge as like, wh why do you, why do you want to treat the existence of God as that axiom? Well, I think that's what Scripture tells us to do. If we don't start with God as the foundation, then uh, ultimately, any other if you take on any other worldview, it ultimately becomes self-destructive. So the only way to actually, as it were, save my knowledge, save my reason, and save my empirical observation, and uh, allow them to actually prove anything would be to presuppose that God exists. If you base anything on upon any other presupposition, it all it all uh, collapses. If you say that the only knowledge, the, the ultimate foundation for knowledge is sense experience, well, how do you know that? I mean, if the only knowledge that we have is, is sense experience, then how would you prove that statement itself? You can't prove it by sense experience because you can't prove by sense experience that the only knowledge we have is sense experience. Are you seeing the problem in, in the way you're approaching things? So you're wanting to know why there isn't an other means of knowledge other than sense experience. No, what I'm asking you to do is actually justify the claim that the only ultimate knowledge we have is sense experience, which it sounds like what you're saying. If you use your approach, I don't think you can justify your use of lo your use of logic at all. You can't prove a universal statement by particular empirical experience. You can't gather a whole bunch of empirical experience to make a universal claim that, you know, a statement is always. Uh, you know, 
you know, A is always not not A. You can't use empirical experience to prove that, but you still rely on logic to try to demonstrate truth. So suppose someone were to come to me and say, I can know things by some other means other than observation. Then I would just want to hear about that because I don't count out that it is a possibility. Like, for instance, God gives dreams to people, and that technically it's a little different from observation, right? So I, I'm not mm -hmm. counting out all other possibilities. I am simply pointing out the fact that you and I both know that when we observe things, we know them. Right, I understand. We can use, you know, it's like the diving board analogy. If you're standing on the diving board, yeah, you can observe things, but the ultimate foundation that makes your observation possible is that there's a more ultimate foundation. You know, we, even Van Til in some of his work says that everyone agrees that we start with our proximate source of knowledge, our own mind, but that's not mm -hmm. the ultimate foundation for our knowledge. There has to be something else that verifies or is a foundation for um, our proximate source of knowledge. So I'm not that saying that don't use experience. I'm just saying empirical experience is not its own justification. I mean, I, I keep saying, like, well, what's your justification for knowing that empirical observation is true? And then you keep saying, well, because I use empirical observation, and then you deny that that's circular. But that's like a textbook case of circular reasoning. Yeah, I, I call it foundationalism. Uh, that's what traditional philosophy calls it. it there, it's never been considered circular, except for by presuppositionalists, I suppose. Okay, can I start calling myself a foundationalist, and then you'll stop telling it Ventilians that they're using circular circular reasoning, and it's it's an invalid method of reasoning? Uh, no, because you're not mm -hmm. a foundationalist. Uh, well, no, I'm not. But I'm saying it's what you're saying is, well, I can get out of the circular reasoning charge just by saying I'm a foundationalist. Okay, and that doesn't really answer the question. Um, and I'm saying in the sense that you seem to be okay with circular reasoning, Vantillians openly say, yes, we reason circularly, so does everyone. But the problem is that unbelievers reason in a, a self-destructive circle. Um, in other uh, writings, Bonson talks about how um, the kind of circular reasoning that presuppositionalists talk about is we're just trying to reason consistently using our own standards within our world. You know? um, but I, I think I'll try... Uh, Moving on from that, you said existence, common hey, sense, and hey, identity Seth, are Seth, logically. Seth, before yes, you sir. go into that question, that's your ten minutes right there. Before you go into that question. Oh. All right. Already, I will ask. Later. Ask that next time, buddy. <laughs> All right. All right, Cody, you got ten more minutes to cross-examine Seth. Seth, the discussion that we've just been having, we can continue having it because I was going to bring it up that you would, in your response to some of our written correspondence, you'd said. I would like to issue you a challenge. If you really think presuppositionalism is just based on begging the question fallacy, then I would challenge you to prove, provide me a reason to believe classicalism is correct. But don't give me a reason to believe that, because if you do, then you're reasoning circularly. So you were explaining Sorry, your you understanding that circularity is okay when you're making a claim about a whole system. And uh, do uh, I understand yes. that correctly? Distinguish between it's it's I, we we agree that it's wrong to reason circularly about a particular fact. That is not the same thing as reasoning in reasoning circularly about a principle that applies to all facts. I mean, just I think it's pretty obvious whether you admit it or not. You reason circularly about justifying empirical observations. You seem to reason circular circularly about justifying uh, the laws of logic as well. For example, so. Um, the kind of circular reason that you seem to engage in, we're okay with. But then you say that when we do the same thing, that we're committing some kind of logical fallacy. So, so if I understand you right, it sounds like you said there's, uh, there's, it's it's okay to be circular when defending a principle that pertains to all knowledge. Is that is that how you described it? Um, it's inescapable. Circular reasoning is inescapable when you're t defending a system of thought. Okay, so it, it sounds to me like both of us agree that uh, it's acceptable, whatever I whatever it is that I'm doing when I claim that I know things by using observations, that's acceptable. You would say it's acceptable, I would say it's acceptable. You'd say it's circular, I would say it's not. Does that sound right? Um, I believe if I caught everything there, I, I think so, yeah. I think what you're doing is you're reasoning circularly um, and you're not admitting it. Um, I think I, I think that's what R.C. Sproul does in his book, Classical Apologetics. I've, I haven't finished it, but I got about halfway through it. 
and there are places where he says circular reasoning is bad and then he engages in it and says but i promise this isn't circular reasoning so i think it's something that uh classical apologists simply have to agree that that's what they do but they have like some kind of it seems like some kind of allergic reaction and a reaction to saying that they do so on your premises uh, do you accept using circularity to reason that reason is the standard, or do you not accept that? Um, in a sense, I think we can. I, I would reason circularly to defend the Christian worldview, which includes not just you know God exists, but it would also include um, the Christian worldview con concerning man's faculties. So the foundation for man's reasoning is that God created him that way. I think that's that's pretty much it because I think um, any other explanation uh, doesn't work. If you try to put it on empirical premises, um, then you you can't prove universal statements with individual empirical evidences. If you try to uh, reason to explain why the laws of logic are true using the laws of logic, again you're just being circular. Um, I think that's what Aristotle did. I think Aristotle used a kind of transcendental argument to explain why the laws of logic are always true because if you deny them then in your very denial of them, you presuppose them, because if you deny them, then you're saying they're not true as opposed to true. So I think um, Aristotle used a kind of transcendental argument to try to explain what the laws of logic are true, but ultimately I don't think he had any kind of uh, grounding for it. My understanding of the justification of logic is, I, it's not one that I've heard a lot of people say, but it is simply that logic consists in affirming one thing and affirming another thing and then continuing to affirm both of those things. So it, I don't believe that you need to prove that logic is a valid method if you will only resolve to observe and to affirm what you observe. That that's all it is. Okay. So so in my in my view I don't separately justify logic. It's just explained in terms of observations. And and so if I've demonstrated that observations are the ground of reason, then logic is is just a part of observation. Okay, how would you, again, how would you demonstrate that sense experience is the foundation for your knowledge? If you appeal to any other standard, you're being inconsistent. If you appeal to empiricism or empirical observation, you're reasoning circularly. I mean, you, you're, I think, I really think you're caught in that position where you just, when it comes to the circularity of, of something, reasoning circularly in this particular sense just means you're reasoning consistently within your entire worldview. We're not talking about reasoning the Bible is true, therefore the Bible is true. But again, I mean, if you can't provide an act, I mean, you said you keep saying you can't provide proof that the laws of logic are true. Okay, well, why do you keep using them then? You can't prove that they actually prove anything. Uh, no, only because that would be, to, to speak of proving that that logic proves things would itself be an absurdity. But I, I say that the laws of logic are valid and that that can be known by observation. That's, that's my position. I don't say that it can be proved. I say that it can be known. And the reason I do that is because I reserve the term proof for something like a syllogism, uh, two premises followed by a conclusion. Uh, but something that is foundational cannot be established by appealing to other premises. Otherwise, those premises would be the foundation. And so there are some yeah, things no, I, that do not have a, found, a foundation uh, in other premises, but rather they are the foundation of all other premises. And uh, it's just my position that observation is where knowledge comes from. And I mean, we, we all know that observation is where knowledge comes from. I, I can't prove it to you by, by saying, here's my syllogism. I can just say, I know it because it's what I'm experiencing right now. It's, it's intuitive and it's, uh, I'd say, self-evident. And you may know it as well. But that's not an, that's not an, a logical argument. That is just an observation, and it's a take it or leave it type of a thing. It it's you you either do admit that you see the things that you see, or you don't admit that you see the things that you see. Well, I, I, again, I would, I would go back to the proximate source of knowledge and ultimate source of knowledge. I mean, yes, I agree. We can know things by observation, but they are not their own foundation for truth. You keep saying, well, okay, you can't prove that the laws of logic are true, but you can know them. Okay, so you say they're true, your belief in them is justified, and you believe in them. Okay, I'm simply asking you, I mean, you say that, well, you can know them by, you can know them by observation. Well, have you, have you empirically observed every instance of the law of non-contradiction? I see what you're asking. It sounds to me like your question is, 
but the problem of induction. How can I make any generalization at all? Can you explain to me why um, the belief in God solves that problem? Uh, well, I go back to something that you said before about, you know, you can't have, you, know, you have to have foundational premises. You can't, you can't appeal to others because then those premises would be the foundational ones. Well, sure. Yeah, I agree that, uh, with that line of reasoning, which is why I make the word of God the foundation of my reasoning, not empirical observation. That doesn't mean I don't use empirical observation, but empirical observation is not its own justification for empirical observation or the laws of logic. I mean, I, I, I've, I pointed out that if you do that, you either have to reason circularly and you end up not being able to prove what you're trying to say anyway, or you're stuck with trying to improve empirically that the laws of logic are true, which you can't do. I mean, you can't, you can't just pile up uh, fact on fact on fact and eventually get to a universal claim. I, I understand that there is a solution to the problem of induction. I think it's a little outside of the scope of what we can include tonight. So I want to move on to a different question, maybe with the last minute or so that I have for this block. Um, do you believe okay. that there is a means of knowledge other than reason? Yes. What does that mean? Um, well, I mean, there are, any, there are a number of different ones. You can use empirical observation. You can use reason. You can look at the word of God. Um, those would be you know, the three main ones that philosophers like to talk to talk about, but there there's, I mean, there's more detail. You can talk about, you know, the linguist, linguistic evidence or evident scientific evidence. When you, when somebody does astronomy, I mean, it's kind of a mix of, you know, induction and empirical evidence and that kind of thing. So um, I think it's inescapable for man to use his own mind uh, for reason. But the question is, what is the foundation for his reasoning? Is it, is it still just his own mind or is it the word of God? When you say that the word of God is the foundation, do you are you familiar with the distinction between the intrinsic and extrinsic, or I think it's internalist and externalist uh, epistemology? Are you familiar with that? I mean, those terms. Study that in detail. It's the idea is that uh, um, you can use the fact that something is true as a standard, whether you know it to be true or not, whether you've discovered it through your own first person justification process or not it's just it's you would be justified in believing it because it is true is, is that the kind of argument you're making um you might have to repeat that i'm not sure i not quite understood the question ah uh, okay all so right, that, hey, Cody, yeah, that's 10 yeah. minutes right there all right seth well, it is now your turn to go ahead and cross examine cody okay cody um, you said you do agree with the statement that uh, all man's knowledge is um, the ultimate source of man's knowledge. Knowledge is his own sensation, correct? Observation is, is the way I said it. Oh, all man's knowledge is based on observation. Okay, and you said that you do believe that you can know. We can know the laws of logic, but we cannot prove that they are true or prove that they're valid. I believe that we can validate them, but we cannot prove them by deduction. Can you prove them at all? Uh, no. When I, when I use the word proof in this context, I mean show by premises and an argument. I don't believe that we can make an argument to show that. Okay, so you're not saying – right, I understand you can't make a deductive argument for the laws of logic. Can you make any argument for them at all? We can present the – the case for why they are valid to acknowledge. Okay, can you make it, do you think it's possible to make a non-deductive proof for the laws of logic? Uh, again, I'm just, I'm using proof and deduction as synonyms. So, uh, okay. you know, I, when I say you can validate the laws of logic, what I mean is that you can come to understand that they are, that they, that, that that the way claims work is such and such a way. You can come to understand that by observation. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, do you believe, you believe there's common ground between unbelievers and believers, correct? Yes. Okay, would you believe that, would you, and I might have to define this, what I mean by this for you, but do you believe that that ground is neutral? Like uh, the facts of reality and facts of experience are neutral, and um, unbelievers and non believers and unbelievers can agree on 
they can agree on their interpretation so far as they go. I am not, I'm not understanding what the term neutral means. And I, you know, I've uh, read Van Til, but I still don't understand what he, what he's saying. Okay. Would you say that you could interpret that unbelievers and believers can generally interpret them in the same way, regardless of their assumptions? Would you believe uh, to, to a degree? Like, I mean, as we talked about with the daffodil, you fail, if you're not a believer, you fail to acknowledge that this is the daffodil created by Jesus Christ. That's a fact about it that you fail to acknowledge, but you still do know that it is the thing we call a daffodil and that it smells a certain way and that it's a flower. You know all, all those things. Okay, and you said you're a foundationalist, correct? I'm a foundationalist, yes. Okay, uh, so that means that you believe that there are unargued premises that ever, everyone has unargued premises that they have from which they have to argue. Everyone has axioms. That's yeah. That's what foundationalism is. Okay. Sorry, I'm just typing this out to make sure I have everything correct. Um, and you said that nobody can argue from different premises. Otherwise, those premises would be their actual foundation. Oh, so let, let me make sure I understand what you're asking. Are you asking whether it is possible to make a deductive argument that the axioms are true? Um, so you, it sounds like you said earlier, so everyone has found a foundational unargued premises or axioms that they argue from, and that those have to be foundational premises. They can't introduce new ones to validate those foundational premises. Otherwise, those new premises would be the actual foundation. You would agree with that, correct? Uh, no, no, because I'm distinguishing between proof and validation. You can give an argument that the one of the axioms is an axiom. You cannot give an uh, uh, an argument, a, a deduction, a proof that the axiom is true, but you can give an argument that it is an axiom, and you are also capable of showing that it is. Uh, you're you're cap you're able to validate the truth of the axiom. That's not the same thing. Same thing as proving it. You're able to validate it, and the way you do it is is ostensively. So. The, the axioms would be existence exists, and, and and I'm conscious of it, and things are something. These are things that you validate simply by observation. You know them in the moment that you know anything. When I look over at this lamp next to me, I am I'm aware that it's there, that it, that it exists. I so the only source of validating it is the experience itself. It it's uh, it, it is self evident. Okay, so the you said you would say empirical observation is self-authenticating. Yeah, the, the traditional way of describing it is that it is incorrigible. It's not to be doubted. It's the basis by which the very concept of doubts or truths comes. Okay. Uh, Hindus claim that all reality is illusory. How do you know they're wrong? Or do you know that they're wrong? You know, in the Western tradition, it would be Descartes. How do we know that there's not a demon or that I'm not a brain in the vat? Uh, the reason that I would give for not believing that is I have never seen any evidence that it is the case. And so someone can multiply possibilities. Well, how do you know that there's not a teapot orbiting around Jupiter? Well, are you going to give me any reason why it is? Until somebody gives me a reason why it is, it's just arbitrary. And so, uh, you know, I have, I have no particular reason to think that I'm a brain in, the, in a vat. The only thing that I can do is to be responsible with the observations, the information that has come to me, that's presented itself to me. Okay, so you, you would say that, well, I've never observed, I, I, I haven't seen any observation or empirical evidence that reality is illusory. So that's your evidence that it isn't. Is that fair, a fair summary? I I would probably yeah, question the framework itself. I'd say, what do you even mean? Isn't isn't the idea of reality being illusory a self contradiction? I'd, I'd ask, what do you mean when you propose this? And I'd ask, do you have any reasons? Can you provide any reasons for the belief? Because we do have a standard of knowledge. 
Okay. Um, if he provided reasons that were non-empirical, would you accept them? What kind of reasons do you have in mind? Um, I don't think Hinduism is a viable philosophy, so I don't think he can. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to trying to see how you would um, deal with it. So, so you would say that um, you you would ask him for evidence that that is the case, correct? Yes, and barring any presentation of evidence, then I would just dismiss his claim as, within my context of knowledge, quite arbitrary. And therefore, I would not judge it as true or false. I would say it was just him making sounds. Okay. Um, hey, Marlon, how much time do I have left on this one? You have about two minutes. Okay. Um, Cody, have you uh, read David Hume at all? I'm somewhat familiar with him. I don't think I've read him directly, only quotes from him. Okay. Are you familiar with his, his, um, so he's very much an empiricist. Are you familiar with his critique of his argument that you cannot um, justify a belief in causality, that it's merely a uh, mental habit if you're an yes, empiricist? He, yes, you and I talked about him. Oh, okay. Um, do you believe his critique is valid? And if not, why? I do not believe it is valid. And the reason is that the, uh, the principle of causality is an application of the principle of identity. You observe, for instance, that when you push on something, it moves. You yeah. observe that the, the force that you applied resulted in it moving. Or when you watch a piece of paper set on fire, you, you observe that the flame consumes the particles and transforms them black, and then they turn into smoke. You, you observe yeah. these things, and... To observe that a paper has identity and that a fire has identity and, th and that they interact in such and such a way, when you apply the law of identity to action, then you, then you understand the principle of cause and effect. Now, D David Hume's argument against uh, the, the rationality of causality, that is a principle that I, I believe Van Til's system rests on, but I don't accept the principle. Well, it's not that it rests on it. I think uh, it, it's simply another example of a philosophy that's self-contradictory. I, th I think Hume's critique is, a, critique is actually valid, but I think it destroys all knowledge whatsoever. It doesn't just... Um, Hume is famous for uh, showing that you, can, you, don't have no, you have no justification for uh, the existence of the soul or causality. He's most famous for causality, but I think it's valid, mm -hmm. and I think that's why it, uh, it demonstrates that empiricism isn't a viable philosophy. Um, I believe that that um, that Van Til actually accepts some of the argument from Hume, and that he attempts to show a re specifically religious way to escape from the devastating consequences of Hume's position. Uh, I, so I actually believe that he's, although he's not a, a Humean, he's accepted some Humean premises, and that that's part of why his system came into being. All right. Well, yes, yeah, he, he that's, that's ten minutes right there. <laughs> All right. If you want to finish your last statement, Seth, go for it. I was going to say, uh, Van Til does accept the premises in the sense that Hume shows that empiricism is, self, is destructive of knowledge. All right. All right. That's 10 minutes for you, Seth. Go ahead, Cody. You got your last 10 minutes to cross-examine Seth. All right. Thanks, Marlon. So uh, you have said that only the Christian God provides the basis for a logical worldview. Can you explain why that would be in uh, contrast, for example, to the God of Islam or uh, the God of some other religion? Yes. Uh, so in the Quran, uh, it talks about one of the things that it says repeatedly is that it's confirmation and uh, continuation of previous revelation. And it also uh, show there are any number of dozens of places where he specifically denies that Jesus is God. Um, I think it's in Surah, 4171, I think it is, where he says, say not three, meaning the Trinity, uh, for Allah, uh, far be it from Allah to have a son. And there are any number of other passages I can point to if I had my copy of the Quran with me. Um, so one of the things, so I do believe that uh, Islam is just as much as any other worldview, atheism, empiricism, or anything else, is just as self-destructive of, of all knowledge. Uh, because uh, if I, believe, if I take the, the Quran as my foundation, one of the things that the Quran tells me to do is take the Bible as my foundation as well. But in the Bible, it talks about in Deuteronomy about how, what to do, how to deal with false prophets. And one of the things that 
a false prophet will be is he will contradict prior revelation. Well, that's exactly what Muhammad does. He very clearly contradicts the New Testament revelation that Jesus is God. So if I accept the Quran, then I have to accept the Bible, which in turn implies I have to reject the Quran. So it's, it's again, another worldview that cuts off the tree branch that it's sitting on. If you accept it, it becomes a self-destructive worldview. So in the Islamic worldview, contradictions are totally fine. So if I have, you know, if I'm wearing a pair of sunglasses, those are sunglasses, and they are at the same time not sunglasses. That's an acceptable uh, proposition in terms of that, that worldview. And if you if you get rid of logic, if you destroy logic, if you can't justify uh, the laws of logic, then you've destroyed your ability to justify knowledge whatsoever. Do you are are you then choosing to be a Christian because of a commitment to rationality? Well, I don't think it's possible to have rationality at all unless you are a Christian. So it's not like, um, and I suppose the psychology of this, you could, you can go a couple of different ways. It's not like I think to myself, well, I just have to have the laws of logic. I really have dedication to them. And, you know, and I've reasoned myself step by step to believing in God. No, I believe that we reason from God. Um, so I, uh, you know, I accept God's existence. And on the basis of that, I can make sense of the rest of my experience. As far as the rationality of it, that's why I accept Christianity. I mean, but as far as like, in terms of my life experience, why I'm a Christian, well, I was raised Christian. Um, that's why. Um, but mm -hmm. as far as the, re that's, 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 a, there's a difference between a reason and a cause, though. The cause of me becoming a Christian was being raised by Christians and um, going to, or having experience with other Christians and going to church and that kind of, kind of thing. That's the cause of it. But the reason I have uh, come to accept it uh, more fully and um, reject other worldviews is because I, well, just the reasons that I um, have stated. So I think it's impossible to have rationality without God. Suppose someone comes to you and they say, I like Islam and I like irrationality. Are you going to appeal to them that they ought not to embrace Islam because it is irrational? I would say, I mean, that would be one way to put it. I would I would try to explain to them that it's a self-destructive worldview. Um, so it's not just, well, you shouldn't accept Islam because, well, you'll lose the laws of logic. Well, you'll lose Islam too. I mean, if you except the Korean. Ultimately, if you reason consistently, you will end up rejecting it as well. It destroys its own foundations. All right, let's move on to a different line of thought. And, and this is, what would you say is the purpose of apologetics? Um, Bonson once said that it, it is not, the purpose of apologetics is not to convert the unbeliever, but to close his mouth. So nobody can convert anybody by means, I mean, you can't love people into the kingdom. You can't preach the gospel to people in a way that necessarily means the unto the kingdom. All you can do is be obedient. Preach the gospel obediently. Do apologetics obediently. And it's it's up to the Holy Spirit. But you do believe that there are right and wrong ways of doing it? Yes. Do you believe that the classical approach is uh, is a like a lesser way? Like, like it's not giving as much glory to God? It's dissatisfying to God? Yes. Um in okay i don't have a reference right in front of me um i think it's in colossians again but there's a passage paul talks about he, he warns um the recipients of the letter against doing philosophy according to the principles of the world rather than according to christ so paul was envisioning a, a situation where somebody could do their philosophy or their worldview or their apologetics they could either do it according to Christ or according to the principles of the world. And one of the things, one of the reasons he warns people against it is because Christians like, you know, not every Christian is going to do apologetics uh, correctly. So Paul was saying, do it the correct biblical way. Don't do it the a way that's less than biblical. Um, and the reason is um, because, well, you destroy your ability to have knowledge. Um, I, I would appeal to Proverbs as well, where it says that if you, answer the, the fool according to his folly, you will become like him. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 2. It says, This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So how does this, the Bible revels in evidences. 
signs, yes. wonders, miracles. So how does that fit in with, with Van Til's view? Uh, well, I would, I would, you have to interpret those signs and wonders and evidences and facts in terms of the Christian worldview. I mean, if you look at Jesus' own ministry, him becoming resurrected was obviously very good proof that he was the Son of God. But there were people who still weren't convinced. So it doesn't have to do with just the facts themselves. It has to do with the worldview that you use to interpret those facts. If I give a naturalist the explanation that, well, Jesus did miracles, well, the naturalist will just say, well, I don't think miracles happen. I believe in just the natural laws of reality, and that's it. I, don't, I, I think he discounts from the beginning that miracles are even possible. So um, I have to give him the facts rightly interpreted. I have to give them, inter give them to him interpreted in terms of the Christian worldview. And also point out to him that if he tries to interpret reality or any fact whatsoever in terms of his worldview, he doesn't, he doesn't even he doesn't have miracles, he doesn't have natural law, he doesn't have anything. So he thinks he can save natural law by being an unbeliever, but I would point out to him that he cannot. So in, in John 4, the Samaritan woman goes into town and she says, he told me all that I ever did. And it says many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Is she doing yes. apologetics rightly? Um, I think she did it obediently, but people, I mean, you can do apologetics obediently and not convert anybody. Um, so I would say that she's doing some kind of apologetics and it, clearly the Holy Spirit was involved because people were actually converted, which would not have happened if he wasn't. Do you, and I think this would be the, about the last question or two. Do you, okay. um, do you have any thoughts about why it is that if if somebody wants to learn presuppositionalism, they have to read Van Til. They don't open up the book of Acts and see people arguing using the kinds of expressions that Van Til would use. Uh, can, can you elaborate on your perspective on how much of Van Til's style of argument do we need versus the kinds of things that we see in Paul? Uh, I think I could answer this by saying one of the things that Pascal pointed out, and I think it's very um, interesting that he points it out because I think he's totally correct. The Bible never talks about natural theology or theistic arguments, ever. So I wouldn't already be predisposed towards using classical apologetics if I didn't already read a book on it. So basically what it comes down to is, you know, if you if you write books about the Bible and they're about apologetics, of course people are going to come up with terminology that, that are not strictly found in the Bible. The word Trinity wasn't even invented until, uh, I believe, about a century after the New Testament was written. It was coined by Tertullian. But that doesn't mean that the principle doesn't uh, show up in there. The term worldview never shows up, but I think it is the concept is in there when uh, Paul talks about, um, you know, the unbeliever's knowledge of God and how he becomes vain in his reasonings when he denies God. Okay. Thank you. That's good for my questions. All right. All right. Seth, you have one more 10 minute cross examination of Cody. Okay. <clears throat> One second. So, Cody, I got um, I got you to say a lot of interesting things in your last cross examination, but I just want to make sure that I um, uh, I might be asking you some of the same questions, but I want to make sure that I get them cor your answers correct. Um, you say that all nine's knowledge is based on observation. Um, how do you know that? My answer would be, you know it by the same means that you know all things. If something is the source of knowledge, then you use that source of knowledge to know even that that thing is the source of knowledge. So I know it so by observation. And I do not consider that circular. How is using your observation to validate that your observations are correct? How is that not circular? In order to answer that question, you have to understand what knowledge is. And I, I don't think that you and I are functioning on the same concept for what knowledge is. So I don't, I don't define knowledge as justified true belief. I think that's okay. improper. And the reason I think that is that uh, the idea of belief is uh, is actually a more sophisticated sophisticated concept than the concept of knowledge. And so it's improper to justify knowledge by reference to the term belief. 
um, a belief is is a kind of knowledge that, that or it's a claim to knowledge so it's a more sophisticated concept you have to have the idea of knowledge itself before you could ever have the idea of belief so let's talk about knowledge knowledge is a recallable awareness of something in reality and so when you're asking me well how do i know that knowledge comes from observation it's it, you're asking me uh, what is the basis of my claim that I have observed that I am observing? And I will say the basis is that I'm observing. Okay. Um, is there, well, let me tag off of that a little bit. Um, the, the classic definition of knowledge from basically every philosopher that I've ever read is justified true belief. Is there a reason that you deviate from that? Uh, it's mistaken. Uh, so uh, concepts have to be grounded Every concept has to be reduced to what what things are observed. So, for example, before you can have the concept of friend, you have to have the concept of person, and a person is is a certain kind of friend. And so, okay. same way, same way with, uh, with you know with this trying to justify where do we get this concept of knowledge? How do we define knowledge? No, knowledge is recallable awareness. The, the, that's a more fundamental way of understanding what it is. And when somebody tries to define it as justified true belief, I think those are correct descriptors, but I don't think that they are the most useful means of approaching the question of what knowledge is because the knowledge is other things too. Okay. Um, so we talked about the laws of logic. You said we can know and validate the laws of, lo lo laws of logic, but not prove them. How would you prove them? Or uh, sorry, how would you know or validate them? My claim is that you validate all claims ultimately by reference to observation. I can explain more about, for example, how you would validate the laws of logic, but uh, it was an accomplishment. It wasn't something that people did until Aristotle. Okay. Uh, yeah, hold on one second. You validate all claims by reference to observation. So all, all knowledge is based on sense perception. Um, how do you know that? I I think I've already answered that. Is there? Oh no, I I understand. I, I'm asking some of the same questions. I just want to make sure I'm very clear in my own notes that I know that I get your answer. You're correct. So All right. So how do is... how do I know that observation is the basis of knowledge? That's that's the question, right? Yeah. You said you val. You, well, right now I'm talking about the laws of logic. You said well, you validate them by by reference to observation. So I'm just asking, in this context, having to do with the laws of logic, how do you validate all claims by, rest, by reference to observation? I mean, is, is it the same answer you said before, just using up your observation? Yes, when you're asking me what's the reason for you to claim something, I'm ultimately always going to point to, well, here's the thing that I saw and here's the thing that you saw. So that's our common ground. Uh, I wouldn't say that's common ground, but... Um... Okay. Um, in my opening statement, I talked about the difference between approximate source of knowledge and an ultimate source of knowledge. Uh, do you think that that's a viable distinction? I believe that when you say ultimate source of knowledge, that you are speaking ontologically. No, I'm speaking epistemologically. So to understand why something is knowledge, what we do is we we ask ourselves, how did I come to have this concept? And you trace it back and you reduce it. So how did I, like I mentioned the, the example of a friend, how did I come to have this concept of a friend? Well, I'm aware that there are people and that some of them are special. Some of them I like to be with and we have an affinity together. And so I had to have all these other concepts like people, affinity, special, these, these, these different concepts. So when, when you're asking me, how do I justify one concept or another, it, it always is going to follow that same process, reduction to observation. Okay. Um, if you had to give, and I very short summaries of the three main critiques of presuppositionalism, what would they be? Why do you think it's wrong? And just make it very short, just three, please. <laughs> sure. Uh, the one that I focused on in my main presentation and in the one that I'm going to do is that I don't think that it is modeled in the Bible. So 
that is just an observation of what the Bible is, what, what the people in the Bible are doing. I don't, I don't think it's modeled. Uh, okay. My second one would be, I, I don't think it's consistent with claims that are in the Bible. So not only do we not get it from the Bible, but what we get from the Bible uh, precludes it being possible. So okay. there's two biblical arguments. And then the third okay. one would be, I, I believe that it is an incl- unclear system. It's, it's not clear what it is claiming. Uh, that's that's the critique that almost everyone has. It seems to be trying to have its cake and eat its two by switching, equivocating, those kinds of things. I could go into detail, but uh, one example would be the the idea of whether man really does or really doesn't have knowledge if he's not a Christian. It's it's unclear to me how that works, and I don't think that it was clear to anyone. Okay. Uh, well, it's clear to me. Uh, my question for you would be, the Bible does talk about unbelievers in different senses, knowing God, not knowing God, having knowledge, and not having knowledge. Um, mm-hmm. How do you how do you deal with those? Well, when it speaks of men having one kind of knowledge, it's talking about knowledge of one thing. It's not saying that there's a difference between knowledge as such and then like really, really real knowledge. It's, it's, it's not that there's some knowledge that isn't really knowledge. It's rather there is knowledge in the sense of wisdom of how to live your life. There's knowledge in, in terms of understanding God's overall plan. And in one sense, you can say that nobody knows anything uh, in the sense of understanding God's sovereign plans that are secret. We, we don't understand we, – we, we almost understand – we understand almost none of it, and the parts that we do understand, we don't understand how it integrates with everything else. So we're, we're, we're just very ignorant. But that doesn't uh, – there, there is no contradiction between the claim that we – I don't know, like in some sense that no one has that knowledge. And then in some other sense where you know it says people did know things. Okay. Isaiah says that those who worship idols have no knowledge. In what sense is that true? I believe he's talking about wisdom for living your life, similar to the way I'd interpret Proverbs 1 7. Okay. Uh, when Colossians 2 says all knowledge and wisdom are deposited in Christ, is there something in the context that indicates to you that it's not talking, uh, that it's talking specifically about wisdom or moral knowledge? Or it looks to me like it's saying all knowledge whatsoever, because there's nothing in the context that indicates it's talking about any specific kind of knowledge. It just says all knowledge. What in there makes you think that it's talking about something else? When it says that all knowledge is hidden in Christ, does that mean that all all knowledge is inaccessible to man? Is that, do you do you infer that? I would say that it's inaccessible in the sense that an unbelieving worldview can't justify the knowledge that it would claim to have. Okay, so so if we're talking about the mysteries that are revealed by special revelation, I agree with you that all that knowledge is hidden from the unbelieving world. Well, sure, but that isn't. Is that what Colossians two is talking about? What in what in the text indicates to you that that's the case? I believe that when you compare Colossians to other passages by Paul or other, you know, other things that have been said throughout Scripture that say that there is knowledge, that you have to understand it as not being the idea that there is no knowledge ever in the world. Um, I I collected hundreds of verses in scripture that talk about knowledge. And so when I read Colossians, I imagine that Paul was not ignorant. He knew those other verses. He wrote some of them. So I don't think that he intended to contradict himself. And I think that that's necessary for exegesis to think through that. All right. That is 10 minutes right there. The final 10 minutes, the final 10 minutes of this cross examination portion of the debate. All right. So now we are going to go into closing statements um, and then Q and a, so everyone out there, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and get those questions in. Um, and after the, the closing statement uh, from Cody and Seth, we'll go into the Q&A. So with that said, uh, Cody, go ahead and give a 10-minute closing. As Christians, we don't follow cult leaders that tell us to believe blindly without asking questions. Christians are allowed to say, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. And Jesus, Jesus does answer that request. Doubts show that we're thinking. Christian view on questioning is that it is not a sin. Rather, the sin would be deciding to look away from the truth that we do have access to. So teaches Romans 1. The apostles do not start by saying, here is our complete worldview. They start by telling people, you admit that you know this and that, and thus you show yourself to be condemned already. You know is Paul's message. And it is not 
you know in terms of you have some kind of secret sense of the divine, some supposedly innate knowledge that everybody has but that nobody knows they know. It is you know based on pointing to the facts that were observed. So Paul talks to Agrippa about Jesus' life and miracles because he already knew about them, and Paul says so. He calls them out. Or how Peter talks to the, the Israelites on the day of Pentecost. They knew the miracles, so Peter says so. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Acts 2. These people did not yet put their faith in Jesus, but Paul is telling them that they did know. They did know those facts, and he says, therefore, they're morally guilty for not following those facts to their conclusion in the traditional sense of knowledge, fact upon fact leading to conclusion. So you can, you can contrast this with a view that is expressed by Greg Bonson. Bonson writes, the apostles were certainly not afraid of evidence, yet we noticed that they never argued on the basis of it. They preached the resurrection without feeling any need to prove it to the skeptics. They did not accept, or sorry, they did not attempt to prove it by appealing to the quote facts. So there's that whiplash again. It's the whiplash between the Bible and the presuppositionalists. Did Bonson not know that in this case, Peter in Acts 2 was an eyewitness to Jesus's miracles, wonders, signs, and that's what he was talking about that day. And did he not know that the crowd had also been eyewitnesses of some of those same miracles? And that is why Peter would bring them up. Bonson says that we do not need to attempt to prove Christ's claims by appealing to the facts. But look at scripture. John 10, the works I do in my Father's name testify about me. John 20, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe. John 14, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. It's this continual pattern of reasoning from what you have observed to conclusions about God. Jesus tells the crowd, how is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? Luke 12. As Van Til himself would agree, unbelievers are not incapable mentally. They are unwilling. We agree there as reformed thinkers. We, what's going on is the believer, the unbeliever is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And on that, we all agree. Van Til, classicalists. But we don't agree, therefore, what should we do? So let's compare what the people of the Bible do versus what Van Til says to do. And then let's see how Van Til stacks up against Scripture. Peter writes in, in 1 Peter 3, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Meanwhile, Van Til is telling us to argue from reductio ad absurdums about the consequences of rejecting the Trinitarian God who is, quote, the only possible presupposition for the possibility of predication. He's proceeding negatively. Whereas the examples we have in the Bible proceed positively. Our models in the Bible speak plainly. They make claims that common people can easily understand and evaluate. And they don't argue by way of negatives, by way of the impossibility of the contrary. Van Til had accepted various premises from the 19th century skeptics. And he was seeking to make religion out to be the only way left for anyone to find knowledge based on those skeptical premises from Hume, like we talked about earlier, from Kant, like we talked about. It's not all that different from Kant, actually. Van Til is in the Kantian stream, although he's, he, he disagrees with him on various things, important things. But Kant found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. And here we have Van Til denying that unsaved man has knowledge in order to show them that they must make a jump to faith and that that jump is a presupposition. Van Til said the true method for any Protestant with respect to the scripture and with respect to the existence of God must be the indirect method of reasoning by presupposition. He insists that it must be indirect. People in the Bible argue directly, positively, and they offer reasons for something. So, my friends, if you want to learn presuppositionalism, don't open the book of Acts. Don't learn about it by taking note of what the first Christians said and did. You have to go read Van Til if you want to learn presup. Why the apostles didn't use it, they didn't teach it. As we hear Van Til's way of arguing, we are struck by how different it sounds from the apostles. Van Til seems to be a man lost in his own mind. He says, God consciousness could not come at the end of a syllogistic process of reasoning. 
But Paul says the opposite. Paul speaks of the knowledge of God being understood from what has been made. The knowledge of God comes from the knowledge of something else, not as the prerequisite. So it's that whiplash again between the Bible and Van Til, and it's everywhere you look. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring, I will give you this land. God appeared to him. God gave Abram miraculous signs. He gave him a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch, and it passed between the pieces of his offering in Genesis 15. We learn in Hebrews 11, from such things, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And Abraham is the father of our faith. He's our archetype. Abraham reasoned about God from the evidence. Consider Moses. When Moses said, when Moses said to God, what if they don't believe me? What was God's response? Did he say, you go tell them that I am God Almighty and that they need to stop suppressing their knowledge of me? No. Instead, God gave Moses three miraculous signs to perform for the people. And Van Til just doesn't seem to speak of this. Instead, he says that the God spoken of in Scripture cannot be proved to exist by any other method than the indirect one of presupposition. I guess Abraham and Moses simply left that part out. So I ask you, was Gideon's request for proof sinful? Or did Elijah sin when he stood on the mountain and said, You call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord? The God who answers by fire, he is God. Elijah built an altar of evidence, and he presented it to people that were not members of this religion already, that had not yet affirmed the essentials of the Christian worldview. Van Til would balk at those who would say that they must, quote, be shown by reason whatever they are to accept as true. Meanwhile, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, meaning miracles, 1 Corinthians 2. And Hebrews says the same, God also testified by signs, wonders, various miracles. The Bible does not merely mention these miracles in passing, it revels in them. So I want to ask you, why doesn't Van Til? As a philosophical idealist, Van Til did not seem to live in the world of observation. He was lost in his own mind, and he was not particularly impressed with what we can know as far as it goes by merely using our eyes. He was not thinking about the Christian faith as something that we bear witness to, using our observations of what has appeared. And so, the Bible and Van Til part ways. The Bible proclaims that the signs and the wonders are given so that the people may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, John 20. Van Til will not revel in these signs and these wonders, not at all. Van Til says that the Christian, quote, must say to the unbeliever that unless he will accept the presuppositions and with them the interpretations of Christianity, there is no coherence in Christian experience. That is an argument of a man well studied in philosophical idealism and skepticism and poorly studied in scripture. Not one time do we see Van Til's suggested methods of apologetics modeled or explained, or even hinted at in Scripture. If Van Til's arguments are important tools that God himself would have us use, then God has a strange way of making that known to us, revealing it to us as he has by his special prophet, some 19th centuries after the apostles, and in opposition to what they modeled and what they taught. So do not go to Van Til as you prepare to give your defense to those who ask for the reason for the hope. Go to Scripture. Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of a fire as you have and lived? Has any other God tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by a great and awesome deeds, like all the things the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes? You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. So says Deuteronomy 4, and we can do no better. Is that it, Cody? <laughs> We're good. <laughs> all right, cool. Good, cool. Man. All right, that is, uh, all right, Seth, you got 10 minutes for your closing statement. All right. Well, I just want to start by thanking Cody for being willing to get on here, and uh, Marlon, thank you for allowing me to do something like this again. It's uh, It's been fun. Uh, I would like to point out in my closing statement, though, that uh, 
my criticism of Cody's method of apologetics is twofold. First of all, despite his stringent claims otherwise, his methodology is not biblical at all. And uh, his methodology is not only inconsistent, but unfortunately self-refuting. If you want to look at the Bible and see how it explains how to do apologetics, there are any number of verses you could look at. Uh, again, I would cite Romans 1, where Paul talks about how unbelievers who do not worship and believe in God become vain in their reasonings. It talks specifically about the Christian Trinitarian God. It doesn't mention the Trinity, and this is part of my critique of uh, Cody. It doesn't mention the Trinity specifically in, in Romans 1, um, but it does say nantes ton theon, knowing the God. So all men know the God. They know the Trinitarian Christian God of Scripture. And Paul says, because they don't believe in him, they become vain in their reasonings. There's nothing in the context that indicates that Paul is restricting that to moral reasoning or religious reasoning or empirical reasoning. He says, all knowledge becomes vain if you do not first worship God. So the, presupp the presuppositional uh, method of apologetics is found in Scripture. You also find it in Proverbs where uh, the book of Proverbs talks about uh, not answering the fool according to his folly. Otherwise, you will become like him. You will become vain in his in your reasonings, just like him. But then you're also uh, supposed to to answer the fool according to his folly. Take on his worldview and demonstrate that it's self-destructive. Take on his worldview to show that uh, so that he will not be wise in his own eyes. So there are uh, there are plenty of scriptures that talk about a presuppositional method to apologetics. Uh, Bonson, both Monson and Ventil very clearly talk about how uh, proofs are necessary. They would not discount or any of the other evidences that the apostles offer. But the problem is, is that you're dealing with, you're presenting these proofs, these miracles to some people to, uh, some of these proofs to believers, and you're also presenting some of them to unbelievers. Just because you are given a true fact that proved God's existence doesn't mean you're going to admit it. It doesn't mean you're going to worship God on the spot. And so ultimately, and I, this is one particular point where it looks like we agree, you can't bring a horse to a water trough and make him drink. You can show him the evidence, but he's going to resist it unless uh, the Holy Spirit transforms his life, unless, unless his world changes, unless he begin unless he decides to worship the Christian God of scripture. So, uh, when Bonson and Van Til talk about proofs or facts and how they we don't appeal to the proofs or facts, we don't appeal to them as interpreted by unbelievers. They have to be properly interpreted in terms of the Christian worldview in order for them to prove anything. Because if you appeal to facts in terms of the Christian worldview, as I've mentioned, again, if you're appealing to the facts in a, a non-Christian worldview, they won't prove anything. I give the example of naturalism and Hinduism. Um, Cody asked me about uh, Islam. If you take on any of those worldviews or any other non-Christian worldview, the facts aren't going to prove anything. You can present the miracle of Christ's resurrection to a naturalist and he still won't convert because he's interpreting it in terms of his worldview. So the apostles were perfectly fine, they were perfectly uh, comfortable giving proofs and evidences, but they also advocated, especially Paul, uh, a presuppositional or transcendental method of apologetics. Just look again at Colossians 2.3. There is nothing in that text that indicates that it's talking about the providential plan of God uh, versus our own knowledge of God's plan. He just says all knowledge and wisdom is deposited, is deposited in Christ. And I think it's um, particularly interesting that it says it's deposited in Christ. It uh, mentions the the um, uh, redemptive aspect of Christ's ministry. We must be redeemed before we can have true knowledge at all. And again, there are also passages such as in Isaiah where it talks about how idol worshippers uh, have no knowledge at all. So there has to be some sense in which uh, unbelievers do not have knowledge whatsoever unless they are converted. And that sense is, is um, communicated in the classical definition of, of knowledge. True justified belief. Unbelievers cannot justify their knowledge claims whatsoever. Um, just as a side note, it always fun, it's always funny to me when people say that Van Til doesn't think we should look at knowledge or look at proofs or evidences. Um, I've actually been reading through one of his books. Uh, I've read through about half a dozen of them. 
and I'm reading through one. The title is Christian Theistic Evidences. I don't know how much more clear Van Til can be that he is perfectly comfortable with evidences and facts and uh, Bonson as well. So not only is Cody wrong to uh, say that uh, his system is biblical, um, it's not. The Bible does teach a presuppositional method of apologetics, but also, as I pointed out, um, Cody's own methodology is, is self-refuting. Cody's own worldview, uh, it seems, and I, through the cross-examination, it became more and more clear that his fundamental commitment is to an empiricist epistemology. That's a problem because that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches a presuppositional method that appeals to evidences, but it is not evidentialistic. It is not empiricistic. There's nothing wrong with empirical evidences. There is a problem with empiricism, which is precisely what Cody advocates. Um, and a number of times I uh, got him to say, just as one example, you validate all claims by reference to observation. Well, as I pointed out to Cody, I'll point it out to the audience again, that is a self-refuting statement. You can't say that all knowledge is verified by means of observation. That statement itself would then have to be verified by observation, and you cannot prove by observation that the only knowledge you have is observational evidence. And if that is Cody's foundation for uh, his, pre his um, apologetical methodology, it's self-refuting. If he appeals to evidences, it's circular and self-refuting. If he appeals to some other uh, standard, some other uh, standard, uh, then it's simply not empiricism anymore. So he either has to abandon his empiricism or take the self-refuting, uh, he either has to abandon his empiricism or accept that his empiricism is, is self-refuting. Um, in either case, his methodology is not uh, biblical. Um, So I would like to uh, just thank you all again for uh, this opportunity. Um, and I believe that is all I have for my closing statement. All right. Thank you so much for both of you for the closing statements. All right. So now we're going into a Q&A and we have some questions here. Um, already? Q&A, man. We have some. So be ready. These some hot questions, man. No, but. All right, first question is, <laughs> first question, let's see, is it going to go? All right, this is for Cody, the question is down at the bottom of the screen if you guys didn't notice it. Question for Cody, how is classical approach not what Paul referred to as persuasive speech? I'm not sure how uh, you would stack up the classical approach versus the presuppositional approach in terms of which one is supposed to be persuasive speech and perhaps vain philosophy. You know where I stand on that issue, but the classical position or the traditional position is that we argue by the signs and we argue from what has been seen to what has been unseen. I don't know why that would be considered vain philosophy. That's just the example that I pointed out again and again in scripture. Okay. Seth, any thoughts? Um, when Paul talks about persuasive speech, I think it is, I most often hear that misinterpreted as saying we should never uh, study rhetoric. So I think what Paul is actually talking about is, um, uh, I, I would say he's talking about in, an, in another reference where he, he says that we shouldn't do philosophy according to the principles of this world rather than according to Christ. So I think I don't think Paul is saying we shouldn't try to use speech that persuades. I mean, of course, he wants people to accept the gospel. So in some sense, he, we, Paul would demand we use persuasive speech. But I think what he's talking about there is a, a sophistical approach to knowledge where there's really no foundation for it, and it's just empty words. Okay. Next question. It says, question for both. How does the moral argument come, to, come into play in your apologetic systems? I'll go first on that one. So the moral argument would be that we all know that certain things are right or wrong, and we all need to be able to account for where that knowledge comes from. And if you study Romans 1 and Romans 2, I believe that that knowledge comes to us from revelation of both kinds. It comes to us from special, but also from natural or general revelation. You know, uh, Paul talks about, does not nature even teach? 
And in, in Romans 1 and 2, it talks about how the people have the law of God written on their hearts, and their consciences testify against them sometimes, even if they don't know the law. So you're asking, how does that come into play in the apologetic? I would not use the moral argument for God's existence any any different way than I would use the argument from any other facts. We have facts. And those facts all point to the fact that there was a creator. And th there are moral facts. I, I believe it's very clear that we can get moral facts from nature. So Hume was wrong on that issue as well. You, you, Hume said there was an is ought dichotomy. I reject that. But it, I don't I don't see that the existence of moral facts is qualitatively different from the existence of any other facts. All of them are pointing to the fact that there was a creator. Okay. Seth? Um, yes. So I believe that the moral argument is a, I think it's a very good um, commonly used argument, and it's probably one of the easiest ones to understand, you know, talking about human causality can sometimes lose people. But I think people can pretty well understand that without, in one sense, without a lawgiver, you don't have a law. Um, but we do have to be clear that we're talking about specifically about the Trinitarian Christian God, because I think the way the moral argument is normally formulated, it wouldn't point us to the Trinity versus Islam. Because if somebody says, well, you, you know, everyone who, you, you can't account for morality unless you believe in a God. Well, which God are we talking about? Because somebody could say, well, that proves that Allah is the true God, or that proves that Brahman is the true God or whatever. So it would, I think it's a valid um, argument, but it has to be formulated presuppositionally in order for it to be valid. Otherwise, I think um, it proves too much uh, and also doesn't prove anything at all. Okay, next question. Question from both. Proverbs 129. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the to ch did not choose the fear of the Lord, can one reject knowledge? Were they not knowing but knowingly rejected? Is that for both to, of us? Yeah, that's, that's a question for both of you. Okay. To hate knowledge would mean that although it, it comes to you and you're able to see that, it, that there is knowledge, you decide you're going to stop thinking about it. You're going to forget it. So, uh, you know, in Romans 1, it talks about how the unbeliever suppress, suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, and that that's the cause for God's wrath. So, do you knowingly, not knowingly, reject? Yeah, it's, that's what evasion is, is when you lie to yourself. And eventually, if you lie to yourself enough times, you begin to believe it. Yeah, I would say it sounds like it's referring to uh, what I, some, one thing that I talked about in my opening statement about self-deception, like the example that I gave with that woman with the, the coffee. I mean, if she constantly has something wrong with her coffee, she's rejecting the knowledge that she really, I mean, she really knows that it's fine, but she just wants a justification for getting angry um, and, and, you know, demanding that her coffee gets remade. So in one sense, she is knowingly uh, rejecting knowledge. But in another sense, she's deceived herself into thinking that she isn't doing it knowingly. And that's the same thing with uh, with people who reject God. They do hate knowledge. They hate the knowledge. They hate God. And so they do, in one sense, knowingly reject God and the knowledge of God, um, but only in the sense that they've also self-deceived themselves in into thinking that that is not what they're doing. All right. Here's your final question. Question for Seth. You say unbelievers can have just justified with the justified beliefs. I think that's really what it means to JTV. Um, justified true beliefs. I'm sorry. How then can they have have the knowledge Paul claims in Romans one? Well, they can't know God in terms of their own worldview, and they inescapably know God in terms of the Christian worldview. So they do know God. It's true that God exists. It's a justifiable belief because everything in general revelation is proof that God exists and it's something they believe. And it's one of those odd circumstances where you have somebody who absolutely believes something and they will constantly tell you that they don't, you know, just like the example I gave with that lady with the coffee cup. So they know God, true justified belief in God. They know him, but it's a knowledge claim that they can only know in terms of their Christian worldview. In terms of their own worldview, 
they can't know anything uh, whatsoever. All right. Thoughts on that, Cody? It sounds like double talk to me. I don't want to end on a downer, but that does sound like double talk because <laughs> I don't I don't understand what it means to say that somebody knows something uh, in terms of one worldview, but not in terms of another. I uh, I think that it needs a clarification. All right. Oh, I like you get. Yeah, I, I can give it if um, um, they know God. They act in. They frequently act psychologically like God exists, but in terms of the worldview that they say they have, in terms of epistemology, they don't know anything. So the reason uh, even unbelievers condemn murder and genocide is because they actually know God, true justified belief, and they will frequently act on that knowledge. They will act psychologically like he exists, um, and they do know that he exists, and they will uh, frequently reason or talk as if he does. But in terms of their actual espoused worldview, uh, they cannot account for any knowledge at all. It, it destroys their ability to say that murder and genocide or anything else is wrong. All right, all right. Well, fellas, that is it, man. Great job, fellas. Cool. Man. You guys put on a great, great discussion. Appreciate you. It was cordial, respectful, and definitely glorifying and honorable to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I do thank you, too. For both doing that um, and as always on, the, on my show i always give first time comers seth <laughs> i give gifts <laughs> first time participants man so uh cody i'll be contacting you after the show to uh, send a gift to you uh, for your for opening up and uh your time um time away from your family and everything to participate in this debate so i do appreciate you but seth i do appreciate you too man i uh, appreciate y'all both sure. man. i really do and um May God bless y'all, and look out for me contacting you, uh, Cody, uh, after the show is over, all right? Thanks, brother. All right. God Thank bless you, both of y'all. All right, folks, that is it. Another episode of the Gospel Truth in the books. I love these type of discussion, Man, it's just like, I'm sitting back in the background. I want you guys to know when I'm in the background, I'm just doing moderating the debates. I'm not twirling my thumbs or, you know just doing whatever I want to do. I'm actually engaging as well and I'm paying attention to what they're saying. And once again, this is another one where I really, really want to understand both positions. Um, and sometimes the best way to understand both positions is to hear them, you know, hear them engage with each other. Um, and, um, and I gain a lot of knowledge just by sitting here for this the last two hours listening to these two guys. So, and I hope that's what you guys did too. I hope you guys both, I mean, everyone out there, both gained something from listening to these two individuals. You know, um, once again, this is just not about entertainment. I understand that the debates have an entertainment value to them, um, but this is not about entertainment in total. This is to absolutely about glorifying God and education um, and understanding what you're, what you're hold to and understanding why you hold to it. Um, and, um, and once again, these two individuals came on, did an exemplary job at doing that. Um, but with that said, I do want to go ahead and transition to um, some of my uh, upcoming shows. Uh, let me pull this up real quick. All right, I have coming up. Oh, man, kind of messed up my overlay, but I think we can see it. I have coming up uh, December 17, 2019, I have Clay Hall, and they'll be debating J.P. Charles and they'll be debating the interpretation of Romans 9. Um, this is a big sledgehammer in the Calvinist worldview, man. You know, the Romans 9, how do we interpret that guy? You know what I mean? So uh, be on the lookout for that one. That should be a very exciting one. Um, also, we have coming up, uh, is there biblical evidence for a flat earth? And that's coming up December 19th, 2019. Um, and that'll be it's uh, Vernon Bonham, Bauman, sorry, and Jonathan Walters. So that should be an interesting one. Uh, first flat earth debate um, coming up. And next, so we have a Christmas showdown. Mr. Mike Jones, Inspiring Philosophy, will be on. And him be debating Darren J. Scheider. Um, and they will be debating the they'll be uh, debating is Christmas a pagan holiday. 
Uh, this is coming up December 23rd, a day from Christmas Eve and two days from Christmas. So that's right on time, right? So December 23rd, 2019 at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So be on the lookout for that. And lastly, I have coming up December 27th, 2019. I have, uh, oh man, I'm not going to destroy his first name, Pinar. Uh, debating Jonathan Walters um, and ever debating is there scientific evidence for a flat earth so Jonathan Walters decided to jump off of both of these and he's pretty excited as I am I, I as I am as well to hear the hear him uh, debate these two individuals on the subject matter of flat earth biblical evidence and scientific evidence so be on the lookout for that and also if you are interested in knowing all that we have coming up um, go ahead and check out the Facebook page and the YouTube page of The Gospel Truth and be sure to like and follow while you're there. Um, and as always, remember to hit those notification bells so that you'll be notified when we upload new content and go live. Also, if you're a person on the go, all this content is on podcast. So go ahead and like. Um, I'm a subscribe there. I'm, I'm on Google Play. I'm on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. So pretty much... All the major platforms for podcasts I'm on. So with that said, you know, once again, um, I can't depart from here without sharing the gospel with you. The gospel is Jesus Christ uh, bled and died on a cross of Calvary. Um, he was buried for three days. He resurrected. And why did he do that? To atone for sin. To atone for the sin that you are under. The wrath of God that you are under. He is the propitiation. The, the, the satisfying of God's wrath that is on you right now so if you are not a believer you know if you're not a believer you need to repent repent and come to Christ that is the goal and that is the overarching goal of the gospel truth is to preach the gospel so with that said I'm out of here I want to thank you for joining me on this episode of the gospel truth may God bless you and may God keep you I'm gone